everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, session on startup, improving startup. Uh, we're concentrating mostly uh, on OpenJDK. I'm Monica Beckwith, and here I have Ludovic with me, my colleague. Um, we are both from Microsoft, and um, and my background is mostly in OpenJDK Hotspot, and been working with Hotspot since op since before OpenJDK was OpenJDK. Uh, so when we were the closed source version, and I'd like Ludovic to introduce himself as well. Thank you, Monica. Uh, yes, yeah, so for my background, I've been at Microsoft for six years. Uh, I've always worked on VMs, so originally Mono, uh, then .NET, and I joined the Java team uh, a few months back. Uh, my focus is really on code generation and how to make sure that whatever code we generate will make your application go faster. Thank you. So as I mentioned today, we're going to talk about improving startup and what we did. So we're going to start with simply, you know, what do we mean by startup and why does it matter? Why do we want to improve it? And then I'm going to hand off to Ludovic and he's going to talk about different, uh, from the JVM perspective, what does it mean to manage those states? And then he's going to dive into use case that we recently had with an internal customer. And then he's going to talk about the future of improving startup and what does that entail. Okay. So what do we mean by startup? So if you were in my earlier talk today with Kirk, we we gave a brief demo of um, Visual VM, and then. I was talking about one of these benchmarks. So this is a longer run of the benchmark and it entails um, warm up as well. So, and this is basically a, a screenshot of Visual VM in, with the Visual GC plugin. What we see here are comp compilation times, class loading times, and of course GC events as well. This was with G1 GC, uh, which is the default GC with uh, JDK 11. So this is with JDK 11, uh, open JDK 11. So when I'm defining a uh, startup, you know, I want to talk about what happens after the application starts, right? So here's when the application started. And then the, there's a phase change, and I'll just mark that. And I'll call it phase one right now. So you see there was a bunch of class loading that was happening, and then there was nothing that was happening for a while, so that, uh, that's what I call a phase change. And then right after that, you see another phase change right here. I will call it phase two. And then there's no class loading activity, but if you look at the compilation time, there is something happening there. And so we call that phase three. And then the application is done, so we'll call it application stop. So this is a typical benchmark, and this is what we encourage people when we say, how do you benchmark? My background is performance engineering, uh, especially with OpenJDK. So this is what, if you were coming to my benchmark talk, this is what I would tell you. This is a typical thing. And what we're trying to do in benchmarking, we're trying to measure, uh, uh, measure during steady state, right? So people are aiming for that, the steady state. So how do we tell what's a steady state here? So because we saw a bunch of class loading activity and also we started with the interpreter. So if you know about OpenJDK hotspot, it starts with interpretation and then goes, it's tiered compilation. So it goes eventually to C1 and C2 uh, with full profiling and everything. So right now it's doing a lot of its work activity in inter interpreter. And then we have this phase called ramp up where there's just a few class loader, uh, loading activities and a bunch more where maybe there's compilation phase changes in there. And the hope is that by the time we reach steady state, we have reached the optimized jitting as well as there's no class loading activity. So it's the application is at a steady state. And if you look at the GC pauses, you see that they're also at a steady uh, phase there, right? What's happening at the end? That's when we ramp down. So it's a bunch of uh, uh, class compilation times that are going down. There's unloading of classes and stuff like that happening. And, and the application stops. So with that in mind, I want to dive into why startup matters. Right? The goal is to 
get to steady state faster, right? So remember, when we're talking, when we're encouraging benchmarking, when we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, how do we measure, when do we measure, we talk about measurements and steady state because that's where you want to go. You want to reach an optimized compilation level as well as you want to make sure that all the class loading activities are uh, put down to a minimum, right? And of course, um, you know, your allocations, from a GC perspective, you're thinking about allocations and stuff like that, but we're not gonna talk about it in this uh, talk right now. Um, and so in this talk, we're gonna co concentrate from the JVM perspective. So what I gave you here is like from an application level perspective, what you can see happening from application start. And then from JVM perspective, I'm gonna hand it over to Ludwig, and then he's also gonna cover a use case that we recently encountered. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Let me just put this on. Okay. So, um, like Monica presented, um, this is all about managing state. We want to have class loaded, we want to have the application being ready to run, we want, there's a lot of state involved. So, what state are we talking about more specifically? So, first, Machines and application have state. Um, even stateless application, for example, in microservices, they have state. For example, the generated code. Oh, most, let's start from the US. From the US perspective, there is going to be the file descriptors or the caches. Stateless services can have that. They can open files. They have uh, connections open to databases and things like this. That is state, for example. At the JVM level, uh, the, some state that occurs is metadata, loading classes, knowing which fields are in which classes. That is. Um, necessary to run the application, and there's a code. So how do you make sure that the code is compiled and is hot so it is not just interpreted, which is slower? And then in, in the application, there's a data. For example, if you are looking at a service which is doing uh, a backend, for example, which is getting data from a database, um, managing it, and then sending it back to the, to the client, this, this has data. So this needs to be initialized. So as Monica mentioned before, to start an application is to reach a specific state, the steady state. All the time that is spent until we are reaching steady state is kind of, it, the application is a bit slower than it can be because by definition, we did not reach the state yet. So starting faster is reaching the steady state faster. So here, I just want to show you a, a little like timeline about what's happening during the uh, steady state, like during the startup and ramp up of the VM. So, Let's say we have the lifetime of the application. At the beginning, like we saw, we have the startup. We have an arbitrary event here. I just use main, but that is the event that we know the application is ready to do, to feel, fulfill its purpose. So for example, in a microservice, it is answering a request. So I define here it as main, but the application is ready to run, but it's not fast yet. It's not a steady state. So now we have the ramp up. So application is answering to queries or thing like this, and but it's compiling code, it's loading more classes, it's, it's ramping up. And then at the end, we have steady state. As we defined, steady state is when the application is as optimal as possible. So what's happening during these different phases? In startup, the first thing that needs to happen is JVM initialization. You need to initialize the runtime. So something that happens then is class loading. You need to load classes to be able to execute them. Once we loaded them, you need to initialize them. So that's the static constructor. Um, here, also, it takes time. And finally, for every classes or every code that you want to run, well, you need to generate code. It being interpreter, uh, like just interpreting the code, that takes time to just generate the code. Um, it being C1 uh, or client level compiler, it being server level compiler, basically just making enough that the application is ready to run. And then during ramp up, we do exactly the same thing like we saw with Monica. Uh, more class loading, more class initialization, more code generation, and etc. We do it for as long as the application is not hot. And again, once we reach steady state, by definition, we don't need to do any of that anymore because we reach steady state. So in OpenJDK today, um, I, I, this, in OpenJDK today, we have a few tools that help speed up some of this. Um, some of these steps. So for class loading, for example, we have a tool called CDS, uh, which stands for Class Data Sharing. Uh, it's been available since JDK 7 or 8, so it's, it's been there for a while. Um, and it really allows you to load your classes faster. And then for code generation, we have AOT compilation. 
And this is just to generate the code, not uh, just in time, so JIT compilation, but ahead of time, AOT compilation. So that allows you to have, um, to basically make a trade-off between the time you want to spend at compile time versus at runtime. And then something that uh, Kristen Floods, uh, so uh, she works at Red Hat, has been experimenting with is called checkpointing. It allows you to take the, uh, make a checkpoint at any stage of the application. So usually you need when the application is hot at steady state, and it allows you to just take a snapshot of that so you can restore it later. Um, it's still very much at a, a research project, so I invite you to check it out. Um, I put a link in the slides. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, but not production ready yet. So I mostly focus on OpenJDK so far. So what about GraalVM? I mean, GraalVM is known for this use case, right? Like fast startup, low footprint. It's what really what they target. So the tool they're using is native image. So the few things that they do very well is AOT initialization, so heap snapshotting and class initialization. Um, they do AOT compilation. But the problem with GraalVM is that they have a closed world assumption. We are going to talk about that a bit later on again. but. Um, but so let's focus on the AOT initialization and AOT compilation for now. So as we saw, yeah, so problem with closed world assumption is all classes are not at compile time. So if you cannot try to load any classes at runtime, that's, that's a limitation. And so it hampers reflection and dynamic class loading. But so for the graph that we saw before, um, here's where native image fits. So basically native image does all of it. It does class loading, it does class initialization, and it does code generation. And that is why, that's exactly why um, Core VM with native image is so much faster at startup because it already does all of these steps before the application actually runs. So whenever you're actually running the application, you're going to be very close to state state already. So that's what gives uh, Core VM um, with native image the, really the kick to get the fast startup. So some takeaways that we have from uh, what we just talked about. Steady state, so it's the JVM and application rich state of optimal performance. Um, classes are loaded and initialized. Method are compiled at highest tier, so it's uh, C2 or server compiler level. And then that in OpenJDK, some solutions exist to accelerate reaching certain states. So for example, uh, class loading with CDS or code generation with AOT compilation. So I'm going to talk more, I'm going to give a demo of CDS on AOT later on in the talk. So let's focus on, uh, on that later. But unfortunately, like we saw compared to GraalVM, for example, there's nothing for class initialization. There's nothing that allows, it, allows us to speed it up. So now that we have talked about uh, how to reach steady states faster, there's a thing, something which is very important, which is not to rush to conclusion before we actually measured anything. And, the import, and that comes with it, the importance of methodology. So for that, I'm going to illustrate that with a, a challenge that we had, which is um, the uh, Java analytical uh, service on Azure, which we went and helped them improve the startup. And so what I can tell you about this is, yes, the pro objective was to make the product more responsive. So to define it a bit more, we have, a ser we have the service is composed of many things. So there's a cluster. Um, composed of many services, the services has to start up, then they are reaching ready, then they are creating a session, and then the session reaches the state ready, and then it can finally answer the first request. So there's many things that need to happen to even like from cluster creation all the way to be able to serve the first request. So we need to look at all of that to figure out, hey, how can we make all of that go faster? How can we reduce the time from cluster creation to first request? So the key result is that I said that we focused on was to go from cluster creation to session ready. So how much time it takes us to go all the way to be able to serve the first request. So for context, um, it is distributed services. So each cluster can be composed of three machines or more. So it can be three to a few thousands. Um, it's mostly Java processes. There is around, on the main machine, there is around 15 plus services. So on each machine, you, we need to figure out how to speed up all these 15 plus services. And then there's, as I said, there's many processes per machine. So we need to figure out how to make all these services work faster together and start up faster, all the, like, the synchronization between all of them. So just super quick Q&A, given that context, what would you do? Like, what would you look at? Just 
some ID thrown in there. For example, who would look at AOT compilation by show of hands? Okay, Monica would. Okay. Um, who would look at, for example, um, what else? What else exists in startup in general? Uh, CDS, for example. Who, do, who would look at CDS? So one person. So the more, most important is to follow performance an analysis process and methodology, because as we are going to see further, AOT and CDS, unfortunately, are not the answer for that from the program we had. The methodology that we chose, we used a Java performance diagnosis model. Uh, so Kirk is in the room. If you have any question, you can ask him. Uh, he did a quick presentation, um, a very uh, a presentation on that at JFocus 2017, and then he did a very quick refresh at an earlier session um, on the JVM performance analysis live on stage. So the method focused on a few things. The main one is to identify the bottlenecks, and the tools we are using are VMStat, which I'm going to show right after, GC logs. Um, how to analyze them, what kind of information we can get from it, and profilers. If, the application, if it appears the application is at fault, like is what is slow, then we need a profiler to figure it out. So here is the output of VMstat. Looks a bit scary, but it's very, very straightforward. So every second, VMstat is going to, to print. So each line is one second on the machine. So the machine is, is it's going to give us information about the memory. So for example, at the beginning, we can see the, I don't know, you can see my, uh, my cursor, but we can see the first two columns being the swap space, the free memory, buffer, cache, and then for swap, how many pages were swapped in, swapped out. For IO, how many data was read and, uh, read and write, written in the system. Like it gives us all kind of information about the system. What's important here is it does not give us information about the application specifically. It's really a view of the whole system, of the whole machine. So to give you some, uh, some pointers, um, we can see like in blue, it's pre-JVM cluster startup. So here we're just looking at one service in particular, one Java process in particular. So um, here we have in blue, the information that happened from the machine boots to the time that uh, the launch event. Launch is when we start the JVM. Uh, main is when we reach the d event we define as main, which is the service is telling us, okay, I'm ready to start. And ready is the moment that the service is actually ready to answer to any request. So what we are going to look at is how can we make this launch to ready um, timeline? So remember each line is a second, so it's around one, two, three, four. 16, 19, like it's 12 or 13 seconds. How can we take these 13 seconds down to, let's say, eight seconds or six seconds? So, so yeah. So looking at that, following JPDM methods, the first thing we are looking at is the user and system uh, CPU time. So I just highlighted it here. So here what this column is telling us is every second, how much time was spent in user space and how much time was spent in the kernel. So this is the first step that gives us an idea of is the bottleneck in the user space or is it in the kernel? So here we can see that quite a lot of time is spent in kernel, especially compared to user time. So we can see that more than 10% of the time is spent in kernel, in kernel rather than in user space. And so that's, that's a red flag. It, we just know that if it spends more than 10% in the kernel, it's a red flag. So from there, we start looking at, okay, what other information do we have here that point us to why is it spending so much time in kernel? So here highlighting exactly what we, we want. So if we look at the different column, the one that stands out is really the BO. BO stands for block out. So it's how much memory um, was, actually no, uh, that's, that's uh, I had to reduce the size. So don't look at block out, look at block in, sorry about that. Um, so block in, which is the column right on the left, is um, the amount of data that was read from disk. And that really gives us a pointer to maybe we're reading too much data from disk. And it sounds pretty typical for a startup, right? I mean, when you start up, the application has to read, read a lot of data. It has to read the code, has to read the classes, has to initialize the, 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 like the caches and everything. It has to read a lot of data. So from there, um, we are looking from there, so we can look back at, okay, 
why are we reading so much data? So if we look back at the graphic that we had before, um, with startup, JV initialization, class loading, class initialization, and everything else, we can see that it basically fits right there. So some of the observations, just to uh, summarize what we saw. So um, in kernel space, we are spending more than 10% of the time in kernel. That's a red flag. From there, we can see that blocking is large when uh, system time is large. So we are reading too much data from disk. So the bottleneck is reading from disk. So what solution are we going to take? Well, the easiest is just to avoid reading from disk, right? So how can we avoid that? Well, we can just prefetch files to file system cache. So for that, we used mmap and mlock. Um, to at the start of the machine, before the service is a startup, we're making sure that all the files are in memory and all the files, so whenever the service is actually start up, it's super fast because all the files are already in memory, so we don't need to hit the disk. So the results, um, we went on average from, on the mean from 51 seconds to 43 seconds, that's 15% faster. And for the P95, we went from 61 seconds to 49 seconds. So that's 20% faster. The only thing we did was to prefetch these files in memory. We looked at the method. We saw that the problem is reading data from disk. We sought to only fix that problem, not anything at the JVM level. And we see a huge improvement. So here we can see the IO. Um, again, after like the VMSAT output, but after we did the change. So what you observe is that at the beginning of the, um, when the machine boots up, we see that the blocking is, is huge because it's reading a lot of data from disk, which is great. And then whenever we're actually hitting launch, we see that the BI is lots, a lot smaller than before. And we also see that from launch to ready, it's faster. So we actually, we actually have proven that our method worked on many runs and on this specific instance because we actually are able to start faster. So some takeaways. Why methodology? Methodology removes, removes biases. If we were to just listen to our experience, we could have gone directly to AOT compilation because in past experience we might know, oh, AOT compilation fixed my problem last time. Maybe if I apply it again, it's going to fix it again. Well, maybe the problem is not the same. So methodology is very important in that case. With methodology, root decisions in data. It's very important to look at data, look at measure, at measuring things before actually taking decisions. And also, apply a solution to a problem. Don't find a problem for a solution. So AOT compilation is great. It's amazing. It does a lot of things, but it might not work all the time. So here I'm going to, in case that I, here I still want to really give you uh, an insight into how IoT compilation and beyond and other technologies works. Um, here I'm focusing in OpenJDK, not native image or, or GraalVM in general, but really OpenJD, what's available in OpenJDK. So JOTC uh, is available in, is the IoT compiler in OpenJDK. It is available in Java 9 plus. It is based on the Graal compiler. So it is using, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Gora compiler is the uh, Java implementation of a compiler that is on par for a lot of use cases uh, with C2. Um, and it, like you can find some documentation uh, on docs.oracle.com. Um, the main um, parameters, which the most useful ones are class name, jar module directory, just to specify what you want to compile. Uh, compile command, if you want to be more specific about exactly what classes you want to compile, how you want to compile them. Uh, compile for tiered is if you want it to be integrated to the tier compilation pipeline. And then dash J flag to pass parameters to the runtime. I'm going to show some examples of that later on. So AOT is great, but if you want, AOT has a cost in the sense that uh, it does not allow you to reach peak throughput. So in the JDK, what allows you to reach peak throughput is tier compilation. You start, you know, like you start with uh, interpreter. It's, it's generated pretty slow code, but generated very fast. It gathers some profiling information and then it allows you to go higher and higher in the tiers. And once you reach the highest tiers, you, you ha pretty much have a guarantee that your code is as fast as it can be, as it can be generated by the, by the JVM. And so 
Integrating to this pipeline is very important for IoT. Otherwise, you, are you may be a bit faster, but you're not going to reach uh, peak throughput. So the pipeline in OpenJDK when you are only jitting looks like this. You, the first execution goes to the interpreter, you go through a few tiers, and if you are lucky enough, it goes to C2. C2 is the highest tier, the fastest. If you hit the optimization, you go back to the interpreter, gather some data, go back to C2. So that's pretty much how the pipeline looks like. If you get AOT um, into the mix, it gets to the tier of C1 with limited profile. And then it's going to, uh, the main takeaway you can take from that is that you are going to bypass interpreter. Here you can notice that you're going back to the interpreter only if you hit the optimization. And so you're not going to actually go to the interpreter for most executions of, of the code. So the advantage of AOT is that it is fa the code generated is faster than the interpreter. And so you're going to have, theoretically, a faster execution at the beginning. So what does the throughput over time looks like uh, in your application? So at the beginning, we saw we have startup, and then we have ramp up, and then we have steady state. So how does it look like? How does the throughput look like? So here, we have the typical case of cheating like the, the bell curve where it's pretty slow at the beginning and then it picks up and then at some point you reach the state and it's super fast, right? It's as fast as you can go. AOT, in theory, is like this. You don't really have um, code generation at startup, so it's super fast from the beginning because the code is already there, it's already compiled, it's great. You don't have to generate any code, so you don't have to go through the tier completion pipeline. So we can expect AOT plus JIT to look like this. So you go from a bit lower than IoT because you still need to gather some profiling data, but you start from higher than JIT starts from. And then you can still reach peak throughput because you are still going through the check completion pipeline to so still gathering profiling data. You are still getting faster and faster and faster. Problem that's, that's in theory. In practice, just JIT still looks the same because nothing changed. IoT kind of looks like this because the problem in OpenJDK is that we still need to initialize the classes. We still need to run the, the classes static constructors. And so what we observe is that code generation is not necessarily a big part of the time spent at startup. A lot of time is spent in just running the code, the static, um, static initializers. And AOT plus JIT is also very similar to JIT, maybe a bit higher, but not that much. And so we can see that we have a small gain, but not as much as we could have expected initially. So that's my practice. So I'm going to give you a quick demo. Uh, you can find the sources there. Um, and please uh, feel free to play with it and to just uh, have any review or any comments on that. I would be very happy to take it in. So I've just uh, cloned it locally. So here we just have a make file uh, to is running the, the steps. We have a hello world and a random sum. Um, so let me just uh, run some comments. So random sum is just going to have a loop and just do a sum of random numbers. That is, sorry, that is just to have an, something that runs longer than hello world because hello world is just too fast. Like it, we don't have time to see anything kicks in. So if for example, okay, we, you do not see that. Um, let me stop presenting. The presentation. So here, um, I'm just going to run a hello world. So here, what you can see is that it just compiles hello world, then it runs Java, it prints some compilation information, some print IoT information, just run hello world. So here, what you can see is that, so here, if you're not familiar with it, that's just the log from the compilation. So that's going to give me information from Java that uh, this method has been compiled to a certain tier, and this happened and happened and happened. Okay, looks like I cannot scroll down. Let me just launch a new terminal. Um, Java IoT. Okay. Um, so if I just get my file. Okay. So here we can see that it's just compiling code. It's compiling the. Um, uh, random thing at some point. Uh, actually, no. It's just, this is not random something. Hello world just compiles stuff, right? And then it prints hello world. What you can notice is that hello world was not compiled. 
It's just it was so quick to execute that the JVM did not have time to kick in to kick in and to compile it because it didn't execute enough. So here, if I just go to run random sum, which is again going to run for a bit longer, random sum. So here does the same thing. Does Java C random sum, Java print compilation, print OT random sum. And here we are, what you can see is that because it's executing a bit longer, it is going to compile the next method, it's going to compile the main method. So it's going to start compiling the, the classes method, right? Because it executes for a lot longer. And here we can see it's going through the tier compilation pipeline, like tier three, then tier four, and then it goes to the pipeline, right? Multiple things are generated of it. So now, if I want to enable IoT, then what I do is that, sorry, um, same thing, Java C random center Java, JOTC, so that's the two I spoke about before, and then I just say, please compile me the random sum class and generate it into the librandomsum.so file. Here I am on uh, Linux, so this is why it's a .so file. And here we can see it's, it's found a class, it found a few methods on the class, and then it just generate native code for that. And so whenever we run the application, we have to say, unlike experimental VM options, uh, AOT library equals, we point to the librandomsum.so, and same thing as before. We just print compilation, print AOT, just to give us some information. So whenever the application runs, the JVM is going to tell us, I load this, this AOT library, so I found that. I passed it in arguments, in parameters, so that's pretty straightforward. And then here, whenever I'm going to try to execute for the first time random sum init, next, main, and etc., we can see that it's not trying to compile it. It's just loading it from the AOT library because it's available, right? And we know that generative code is a bit faster than interpreter, so JVM just says, let me load that. It's going to be faster. But what you can notice is that we are never hitting the tier compilation pipeline. We're never going to go to tier three, then tier four, and et cetera. It just does not happen because the way we compiled AOT, we compiled with the AOT compiler, we said, don't bother generated code that fits in the tier compilation pipeline. Gener generate code that is not, basically. So if you want to generate code that is going to hit the tier compilation pipeline, then what you need to do is just say compile for tiered. So similar to before, JOTC, verbose, librandom sum, and then specify the class, and just need to say compile for tiered. And suddenly, whenever you run the application, you run it exactly the same way. Just say uh, unlock experimental VM option, AOT library. So also going to load it. Here you can see that similar to before, init, next, class init, and main are going to be loaded from the AOT library. But for any function that is going to execute a lot, for example, main and next, this one are going to go into the tier compilation pipeline. And so here you're going to reap off the benefit of both a bit faster startup and reaching peak throughput. Any, any question on that so far? Oh, yes. Um, there is it still compiling the uh, standard library. Is that so you can compile the standard library if you want. Okay. So let me just uh, show you how. So to remember, so uh, this is available in um, JDK uh, 9 plus. So that's, that is with the modules, uh, the modular thing of um, JDK, I think it came with nine. So if you want to compile a module in the same image, you just say uh, module, I think it's java.base. Yeah. Huh. Uh, fail to find, find. Um, so here I just need to say class name, I think. Okay. If you want to, for example, just generate um, the AOT library for um, Java base, then I'm just going to call it uh, java.base. Oh. 
I'm just going to call it. Like, you can call it whatever you want. It does not matter. So you do that. And that is going to compile you for the Java base. So here you can see there's a lot of methods. So let me just make it a little less verbose so we can actually see what we're doing. But here we're just saying, hey, can you please compile me the module Java base? And it's going to take all the methods and all the classes in Java base. And it's going to create you uh, a library for that. And then later on, we can just specify to the, to the Java command line, please loan me this AOT library lib Java base. And it's going to just take the, the methods from there. So oh, that's a good idea. Let me just. It is. Um, so a limitation of JLTC today is that you need to have the same version, you need to have the same platform, yeah. and it's better to have all the same libraries. So usually what you do is if, let's say, you're in a container, you are going to compile with Maven, Gradle, like whatever tool you have your application, you are going to run JLTC on the output of that, and then you're just going to copy-paste both of them. Like wherever you are going to, whichever environment you're going to run your application in, it's better to have GOTC run exactly at the same place. Because there's no guarantee that if you compile on Windows, it's going to work on Linux. There's like zero guarantee of that. So as you can expect, Java base is pretty big, so there's a lot to compile. Uh, usually it takes a f one minute or two, so um, we can come back to that in a, in a second or two. Any other question on GOTC or? OK. So uh, the next thing, uh, big features in OpenJDK, as we said before, is cloud data sharing. So there has been, let me just start from the, OK. So there have been a few iterations with JDK 5 was introduced class data sharing. So it was only for the uh, RT.jar at the time, so not the user application. With JDK 10 was introduced application class data sharing that allows people to use it for their own application instead of just the, the standard library ones. With uh, JDK 12 was introduced default class data sharing. So whichever OpenJDK you download from the, like Adopt OpenJDK, Oracle OpenJDK, Amazon Coreto, like any of them, they are going to have a pre-generated class data sharing archive for the Java base and for the few central libraries, just so for any use case you have, you are going to have this extra kick without you having to do anything about that. And then JDK 13 was introduced dynamic class data sharing, which is, allows you to dump this archive when the application shuts down. So you don't have to do anything before. You can just say, hey, if you don't have the archive, whatever, not too bad. But dump me one at the end of, uh, of the run so you can reuse it later on at uh, future, um, future execution of the application. So here, same thing. Um, I'm just going to do a quick demo. You can find the sources on GitHub. Um, so let me just open. So it's still compiling Java base. Um, demo Java CDs. OK. So here, uh, let me just keep clean. OK. Um, so here we have just Hello World. And we have a make file also just to simplify our thing. So in the make file, for the presentation here, I'm just using JDK 13 because as we saw, uh, dynamic class data sharing is only available starting with JDK 12. Uh, so I just took the latest JDK. So just clear. Um, here, what are we doing? Class data sharing only works with jar files. So you need to have a jar. Um, and um, so if you just have a class, you first need to jar it and then have, uh, be able to use it on that. So, but long story short, we just compile uh, the hello on the Java, create a jar, and then we run Java with, this, with that here. So we just say disable. Um, here for the demo, I'm just showing how we can run without, what it looks like when you run without any class data sharing. So if you want to disable completely class data sharing, you just say X share off. It's going to completely disable it. It's not going to try to load anything. So here what you can see is that even the classes that come from Java base are going to be loaded from uh, the Java base jar. So everything is going to be loaded from scratch. 
And what you can see is that hello world is also going to be loaded from the source file, uh, the hello world adjar. Now, if I want to enable CDS, so here the only difference is that the only difference is that I said X share on. By default, it is on, so you don't have to do anything for that. And same thing, I'm just logging, uh, passing the hello world.jar. And here what we can see is that, for example, Visual Machine Error has been loaded from the shared object files, which is the CDS archive. But what we can st see still is that hello world was still loaded from the file. That did not change. We did not generate an archive for hello world yet. So the JVM just doesn't know where to, where to load it. So I talked about before about AppCDS. So AppCDS, it just allows you to join an archive for your application. So here what we're doing is we're saying Java xshare colon dump. Dump is not going to run the application. It is just, let me just finish that and I answer your question. Um, xshare dump, so it's just going to say, load the classes, don't run the application, just dump an archive afterward. And then you just give the name of the, the um, uh, the list of classes you want to you want to dump, and then you just say, "Hey, dump it in this file," and just run it. And then, after all, we can we can see we just pass this archive to the JVM we are running with, and we can see that the Java lang and everything is still run from a from an archive from a shared object files, and we can see that Hello World was not loaded from files but from an archive. Yes, you had a question. Sorry, I didn't understand the beginning of your question. What is the advantage to load the class from the shared object file instead of the jar? It's faster. The archive kind of pre-processes these class files. So instead of having to pass the class file, which is pretty slow, it just has to load this archive, like uh, literally map it in memory, and it's available. So it's, it basically pre-pass pre the class files to a format that the JVM can then just use. So, yeah, the gist of it is it preprocesses it. Okay. So that is for uh, CDS and um, application CDS. So here we can see that, so just to come back to the, um, to the Java base one. So we see that it finished compilation. Um, we can see that we have lead Java base tiered. Let me just... So we can see that it's pretty big. I mean, JavaBase is a big library. But so the image of JavaBase is going to be 400 megs. So it's, it's, it's sizable. And so if we then want to um, just run it, can you just... Cat, uh, make file. So. Let me just copy paste that. So I want lead Java base. So here I'm not going to do the, um, the random sum. Like I'm not going to load the AOT library from random sum. I'm just loading that. If you had the library, nothing would stop you from having. You can have multiple AOT library. So you can just specify it multiple times. Um, here and then I'm going to just say dash xx. Um, print compilation dash xx print apt and I just say uh, random sum I need to compile random sum java random sum sorry Yeah, thank you. Okay, so here we can see that, well, it's loading all the classes from, from AOT because it's just, it's faster. So it's going to load all the, the AOT library, all the methods from the, um, from the library that it actually needs. And so here we can see that, well, it printed the sum and so we can see just going through. Okay. 
to do the other thing. So it takes a long time to be ready for everything. So think of that and the judge, whatever you do to do that, to do that part, mm -hmm. you should add everything. Oh, so I don't, I'm not restricted to just the module level. You yes, actually go more specific. Absolutely. Yes. With, with compile commands, you can say, hey, can you please compile, compile only these classes or this uh, package? And you can be very, very specific, or even just, can you compare me just this method on this class? Because I know I want that. So. Yeah. So let me just go back here. Um, so what's missing in OpenGDK? I mean, we saw that there is a few features available, but we saw that they were still a long way to, to be perfect. So we release namer, this is not a Microsoft roadmap. This is just what I personally see as missing in the OpenGDK. So support for AOT initialization, as we saw, uh, it is something that's, that's uh, missing in OpenGDK, and that really gives a huge advantage to, to GraalVM. So here we have a lot to learn from native image. Um, so what we could do is a better in integration between different components. JLink, which is a linker, which as you um, as Monica pointed to, allows you to say to do a tree shaking. So take only the classes that you care about and package them into the application. Uh, JOTC, which is the OT compiler, and CDS, which allows you to um, uh, do class loading ahead of time. So CDS today allows you to initialize strings and put them in the CDS image, so you don't need to allocate them uh, when loading the, the application. So if we were to do something similar to native image, we would go beyond string and be able to have any arbitrary object graph and dump it into CDS. So that's the um, hip snapshotting feature of uh, Graal and or GraalVM and be able to load that at runtime so we don't have to have to initialize all this object graph when starting an application. There's also a better integration to the tier compilation pipeline. Um, as we saw, we don't have as well, like between the theory and practice of the integration to the tier compilation pipeline, it's not as well as we would like it. So an example we could do is integrate at tier three. So instead of tier, uh, tier two, uh, because tier three is more similar to the interpreter. Uh, so it's going to gather more profiling information. And so we are going to be closer to an interpreter, which is just faster. So, and if you want to dream very fast, it removes the need for the interpreter completely. And what uh, uh, a thing that could uh, allow it is the optimization from C2 to AOT. So we completely remove the interpreter from the picture. So that's kind of a dream situation right now. And also, if you are to see very far, it would allow for GLS runtime with, for example, JIT as a service. What you could imagine, you do not do any code generation locally because you have this tier three. Uh, with AOT, and you have the G compiler, the C2 level compiler, somewhere in the cloud or somewhere else in your data center, and you just offload compilation to that, so you don't have to do any code generation locally, and that would reduce both the pressure on memory, the pressure on CPU, and all the overhead of JIT compilation. So some takeaways. There's various tools available in OpenJDK with JLink, JOTC, and CDS. None are silver bullet. Uh, they work well for what they do, but they are not going to fix all our problems. Uh, there is a lot of room for improvements, uh, especially support for AOT initialization, better integration to it, and better integration to the tier compilation pipeline. Any question on that? Or? Okay. So thank you very much, and um, thank you to Monica as well. And yeah, if you have any question, I would be happy to answer them.